I'm Paul Cashmere. This is Noise Eleven's Interview from Home series. And here's Michael Burrows. Michael Burrows, welcome to Noise11.com. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you and good, good to be on the show. What's that uh, behind you there? You've got a bit of a, a, a record presentation up the back there. What's that? Yeah, well that, that, I, I went through a phase um, of collecting old advertising. In fact, I still do collect old advertising from, you know, from the, from the, this one's actually from France. And I just was captivated by it. As, as you are looking at it, it's just beautiful, isn't it? It's just this kind of record man. I don't know what it says. It's obviously got space at the bottom for, you know, sort of buy us here or buy this now or whatever it is. Right. And yeah, just fell in love with it and actually ended up seeing it on an episode of Frasier in the background in one of their studios. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. It must mean yeah. something then. Yeah. Well, yeah, it must mean something. I just call him record, record head man. This is, this is kind of the studio or one of the rooms, um, like a jam room and uh, lots of old, old intricacies. Got the Wurlitzer there. And if I could spin it around, you'd even see more junk uh, <laughs> lying around of old Pac-Man things. And uh, I can give you a tour later. We can go for a little walk around. There's some really weird artifacts. As I'm sure behind you, it's very similar. So we've probably... Um, collected lots of things and i'd love to go through your record collection we're, we're, we're both we're both uh, collectible junkies that's for sure i'm a hoarder <laughs> i'll be on an episode of hoarder one day yes yes i'm glad you said hoarder i had, i'm glad you hoarder. added the duh at the end there yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> this is a family show uh yeah yeah the internet there's no there's no swearing on the internet <laughs> there's no swearing on the internet no now you've uh, you've been quite newsworthy uh, throughout 2020, regardless of the fact that we've been slowed down. But uh, before we talk about the the new song with Lior and Simon Starr, let's go back to the previous one, "Please Don't Cry" with Neil Finn. And uh, yeah. you know that's quite an accomplishment, getting a song together with Neil Finn, who yeah. I guess at the time uh, was also a, a member of Fleetwood Mac. Now. That's right, and a, and a good member of Fleetwood Mac. Who would have thought that he'd be able to do a lot of those licks? But when you think about it, he's actually perfectly matched. He's so he's the consummate performer, gentleman. There, he's got all the harmonies down packed, and you know his guitar moves are, 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 are beautiful. So it was lovely when I heard that. I was I was like, yeah, that really works. ACDC, maybe not so much. Fleetwood Mac, definitely. It was great um, seeing Fleetwood Mac perform. I got you. That would have been amazing. Yeah. Where did you see them play? When they played here in did, Melbourne. Did get... uh, that was only yeah, last right. year, I think. <laughs> yeah. Trouble is, with this with this lockdown uh, in and and the, and the second lockdown, I've got no idea what time it is anymore. <laughs> no, who knows? Is it twenty twenty? I don't know. I but, I know uh, I saw it? Fleetwood Mac with Neil Finn somewhere in a previous somewhere. life. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere, it could have even been a dream. Who knows? It was in a time when you didn't have to wear masks. True, true. So um, uh, tell me so about yeah, look, how you two got together. Yeah, well, look, I had um, I had not run away from playing music, but I'd kind of just become a little bit disillusioned, you know, with my own career. Um, I had played in the 90s a lot, playing in bands, and then set up, you know, my commercial business doing a lot of jingles and things for ads, still playing music, but just not, not as much, but I'd never stopped writing. And um, I remember it was the birth of my youngest child. Um, and my wife said, you know, I'm sick of hearing these excuses. You know, you've got to, if you're a writer, get out there again and start doing it, start playing. And she booked me a show and I played to, you know, a hundred of my friends. And I really believe I'm not a religious person, Paul, but I really believe that there's a spiritual something that goes alongside of us and when the time's right to jump into things all kinds of things happen when you're ready as a, as a person and uh i was and i put put it out there and the next thing that happened was um a bass player from a previous band said to me you know i've seen that neil finn is working with a charity called medicine mondial and if you put a little bit of money up for it um and send some demos you get an opportunity to, to hang out with him. At that stage, it was literally just hang out kind of thing. I had no idea what it meant, but I, I knew it had to be mine. I'd sung split end songs to my grade four class with my air guitar. Uh, you know, so his voice had been 
part of my psyche for so long. And, you know, I just knew I had to have that. I'd saved up a little bit of money that I was going to use to promote my new songs that I'd kind of written. But I thought, stuff it, I'll throw it all onto this. And the next thing I know, I sent some demos. And the next thing you've got your hero writing back at, you know, .com.au. And it's it's your guy who you've, you've dreamt about. And he's saying, I love these songs. I'm going to bring a band in and record them. Uh, come down to Auckland and hang out at my studio. He lives above the uh, Roundhead Studios. And it was exactly, you know, I, I'd imagine it would just be that. We'd, we'd get there, maybe record with this band or whatever it is. And, and that was amazing as it was. So I walked in, you know, on the first day and there suddenly is, you know, your hero in front of you. And I know you've met a lot of amazing people, but I'm still starstruck <laughs> by someone that I'd had so many questions in my life and had spent so much time romanticizing and uh, about, about the way his songs come together. You know, Crowded House for me was, was my education really in music. So there's always been a part of him in there. And, you know, I got in there, I said something stupid about the weather and the seasons and just making, trying to make, say something silly. And uh, it was pretty obvious straight away that Neil is a real work. His, his work ethic is, is, okay, great. Yeah, I'm Neil, good to meet you, but bang, it was straight into work. And we recorded solely for a few days. He was part of every session. He brought meals down from upstairs. He, he stayed with us the whole time. And it was sort of the second night where I was struggling with some harmonies and, you know, Neil Finn next to me, who I'd just grown accustomed to sitting there with a the guitar, strumming along to my songs and talking about it, sort of said, do you mind if I have a, have a go at the harmonies? And I was like, um, let me just check. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I was ready to die right there in that New Zealand chair. I mean, if there was a defibrillator on hand, it would be, could have possibly been necessary because he went in and nailed this harmony and then played Wurlitzer on the track. I mean, this guy, it, it, Neil is just, he's the most generous guy, first of all. And second of all, to just give me the time and validate me as an artist to put his own voice onto it, it was life-changing. How do you come back from that? I, I left shaking and still have his voice on a solo track um, of the harmonies, which I've played nonstop before I'd, I'd, I'd even released it and just wanted to hold it to myself because I've got a piece of my hero that no one's heard, mm. you know, that no one has heard. So the chance to put this out, you know, was was incredible. It, it, unfortunately, it happened right as COVID hit and a lot of the promo stuff and the tours and all that sort of stuff I wanted to do on the back of it kind of all fell away. And I don't know if the single actually got as big an exposure as I really was hoping people could hear it. But that's that track. That's that story. And uh, I feel very lucky. And I got to be part of an amazing charity that he's part of. I got to be validated as an artist um, for doing that. And as a result of that, then suddenly I talk about this, this, this line that runs along parallel with our lives. Then Martha Wainwright handpicks me to go on tour with her. And, you know, it was really amazing. Everything just started falling and made me feel, you know, what I'm meant to be. It's what I've always done, been a songwriter. Why am I running away from it? Mm. It's not just about making a living. It's actually what I love doing. Uh, regardless is uh, is working in the advertising uh, world uh, a bit like being a songwriter anyway if you're you know coming up with uh, a mel melody for a jingle uh, how different is that from actually writing a song it's not it's not at all you're right it's like if we're briefed to sing about anything from a new shampoo product to a, a retail pharmacy chain it's still staring at a blank piece of paper and trying to create an emotion um, I, I always call it like 30 second rock stars. You know, we're really just finding the, the hook, if you want, of the song. And that's what becomes the thing that's easy to remember. Often it's a chorus that didn't work in a song and I'll bring it in and it becomes a jingle and vice versa. There was actually a song that I recorded with Neil Finn called Hinges. I don't know if I've ever sent that to you, but he sings on that as well. And that was actually, a. <laughs> it sounds really tried saying it, but it was a song for like a, a range of dips initially and they didn't buy it. So I was like, you know, fuck you. I'm going to turn this into something, something good. And the melody was really good. I always liked it and it became a song, you know? And yeah, so it, it really is like being a songwriter just in a smaller format. What are some of your greatest hits in the ad world that we would know? <laughs> yeah, well, one through cabs, every time, everywhere, one through cabs will get you there. Um, 
Chemist Warehouse. Woohoo! Chemist Warehouse, why pay more? I feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> uh, you might you might either get people um, people either want to hug me or stone me. I can never quite tell. Yeah. Um, uh, goat soap was another big one uh, that, that people started to talk about. Look, it's I'm so proud of all of them, and um, I feel so lucky, Paul, that I get to make music and you know try and crack a living out of doing that. You could uh, almost have those clients sponsor your live gigs and do their ads in well, between was, your songs. Someone was joking about that yesterday, saying that it, maybe if I did a jingle tour, the show would go for five minutes in total just because back to back, even with the 12 inches. But um, perhaps if it was just an all out, listen, we're all going to need a shower after this, but it's just all sponsor, 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 sponsor. Here's the song, buy the merch, buy their thing, buy their shampoo, buy their muffins, and it's a, it's a great tour. <laughs> yeah. A jingle tour, you'd have to have I... a hundred song set list, wouldn't you, to fill in an hour? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've never been able to blend those two worlds. Um, I've always felt, I've always was embarrassed of my jingles and never really put my name to them because I felt like as an artist, people would feel that, well, how can you write songs about love and heartache and try to, you know, be taken serious in, in, in the pop world when you're kind of writing about uh, soaps and, you know, and, and, and uh, political campaigns and things like that. But as the years have gone on, especially now with this new thing that's happened in the last couple of weeks with this COVID uh, song, I felt comfortable, you know, and, and when Rolling Stone does an article on you and they, they're happy putting those two worlds in, I felt really comfortable with it for the first time ever in my life. Mm. Um, I felt comfortable that people aren't going to judge me for being um, this shallow little jingle writer and also being a serious, credible musician. I think they kind of work now and I'm at a stage in life where I, I probably don't care as much. <laughs> Well, you mentioned songs about heartache. Let's talk about a song about heartache, brand new heartache, uh, which you've done with Lior and Simon Starr. Now, I know who Lior is. I wasn't familiar with Simon Starr. So what's his background? Yeah. Yeah, Simon Starr is like an incredible um, musician based in Melbourne. I've known him since we were, we were teenagers. He's, you know, he performs in Deborah Conway's band um, of, of recent, I'm just thinking of recent things, but he's also been very um, influential in the jazz world. Um, very, very, very high-end jazz artists. He's played with everyone as a bass player. He's also put out his own album, Sunday Simon Star. He's got an incredible outfit called Yid, which is a Yiddish-based klezmer, but new age klezmer style music that's kind of, it, it's got people like Josh Abrahams in it. Um, it's got, you know, uh, uh, um, Willie Zigger plays in it as well. Like it, and it's got Husky as well um, from, from the band Husky. And, you know, and so he's been around a long time. And those two guys, are, are two guys that I've grown up with, I've followed both of their careers. We used to get together in, in this room, actually. Um, we were, we, we'd all come together. And, and it was really about not any expectation to write a song or to do anything, but we all appreciated each other and respected each other. And someone would start off with something, uh, in this case, it was a line, there's a spider on the wall and I feel like I could fall. And that kind of all inspired us and suddenly Leo's got the guitar and the, the riff coming out and Simon's playing keys. I happen to be playing drums and I'm not a drummer, but the way this studio is set up, if you can see around, it's kind of in the round. So, um, so everybody, it's like a circuit gym class. You know, you can stop that thing and then jump to the next, the next thing. In, that, in this case, sometimes moving around instruments allowed you to think differently. Um, and in the, in, in the case of Brand New Heartache, it really fell really, really quite quickly. And we were vibing on a song within that night. And uh, um, as, as is the case with three artists, I was like, well, Leo, you've got to sing this. I mean, you've got this beautiful voice. And he's like, no, man, I, you've got to sing this. And Simon's like, well, so we all kind of were pinning it on each other to be the lead. We recorded um, three songs out of that out of that jam session um, with Ben Edgar, who's um, the guitarist for uh, Gautier, um, Angus and Julia Stone, um, Boys and Bear. I think he's gone on tour with them. So he's an incredible guy. And he had a studio in Dandenong. And it was just a beautiful environment to record. And, um, yeah, we had a ball. Mm. Well, you know, in this COVID world, uh, you would have got out and performed and, you know, there's been no gigs for months. Uh, so 
from that perspective, you've got these new songs out there, but you don't get to get out and give them a new life no. of their own because songs tend to take on a life of their own, don't they, when you uh, perform them over yeah, time? Yeah, well, you're really – that's right. You know, you're right. And when you're writing, there's nothing better than being able to connect with someone and seeing how – and road testing them and, and playing them. And we didn't – we don't get to do that, you know, for so many artists – uh, you know, my heart bleeds for them, you know, and for all of us, like yourself too in the industry, we're all just, it's its a very tough time. It's a really hard time because we all have so much that we want to give and so much that we're part of. And, you know, um, people like yourself who give so much to this industry, you know, who really are the backbone of the reason why we create things. So we've got somewhere to actually promote them and talk about it. And you've been instrumental with so many artists and with my stuff too, promoting it. I just wish there was a way to give back and be able to play, but that's going to be a little while. It's going to be a little while away. Do you feel the same way? Do you think it's a, it's a long way off? I think uh, we're going to see a very good op opportunity for Australian artists over the next 12 months in that uh, we won't have very many international tours, if any at all. And uh, when we do open up and get back to some sort of uh, life like we once had, uh, we won't have the clutter of the international artists. So for local artists, I think we're probably about to go into a very good period uh, from a live music perspective. I know it's troubling right now, but once we get past the, the danger zone and we can reopen, uh, we will be reopening with Australians. We won't be reopening with the world. And I think there's going to be a very good opportunity at that point for uh, probably a 12-month window for Australian acts. Wow. So, so maybe some of those old format uh, Australian kind of bass concerts will will really have it have their chance to shine. You'll again. see uh, Australian artists be able to perform, be performing in larger venues, probably uh, as you know, two or three acts on a on a bill. Uh, mm. But yeah, I think I think we'll see some uh, pretty good upswing in the music industry when it is allowed to happen again. But until that happens, no one's doing anything. And uh, that is also yeah. going to do a lot of damage because a lot of artists won't be able to come out the other end and just pick up where they left off. No, no, they, they would have. Probably got young families yeah. or whatever reason, but they're going to have to probably move on to uh, some sort of other occupation just to keep their head above water for, you know, their, their, their families and kids. Which is really sad. And, um, you know, there's just so much loss that's happened. I know people are losing their lives and I feel for, for that part of it too. And it's very scary, but in terms of, um, you know, the ramifications on, on art and business and culture and, you know, it's huge, isn't it? It really mm. is. It's so it's when you start thinking about it, it can really, really um, weigh you down. Um, I yeah. feel that for sure. And is there a Michael Burroughs album on the way? I mean, we yeah, just had I one, have... but is there another one <laughs> on the way? There is. No, there is. I've been writing a bunch of songs. I was actually meant to be recording last week um, with um, Greg Walker from Machine Translations. Um, I really have been a big fan of his um, of his music. And we got together before this next lockdown and we had it all planned. My whole band were ready to go down to his place in, in South Gippsland and record. Um, really excited about the new songs. You know, there's a real, um, there's a really great vibe on them. That's the last album was done in Nashville and it, it, it was never on my radar to record in Nashville. I'm not, I'm not necessarily a traditional country singer or anything like that. Not that Nashville is just that, but the players that played on this, were really, you know, A-grade musicians like Keith Urban's drummer and, you know, incredible people. The guy that mixed the album um, had spent time with John Lennon three days before he was he was murdered. You know, Steve Marcantonio, people like that. They got great stories that you can imagine. And I know as a Beatles fan, it's all I wanted to talk about. Let's not record. Let's just talk about John Lennon. Can we? <laughs> we'll use one day of tracking just to talk about that, and then we'll get onto the, <laughs> the album. Yes. <laughs> They're all the fun bits yeah. of the job. <laughs> yeah. So um, this new album, yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting some new songs out there because it, it's the first time it's going to be my my band mm. playing. And these guys have stuck by me. I don't know why, 
and I don't know <laughs> how, but somehow whenever there's an opportunity to play as a band, they've been there, they're all in different bands and doing different things. But, you know, I, I feel very lucky to, to have a band and get to get to play hopefully again. Well, at least in the meantime, we've got brand new heartache out there. So uh, that's, uh, mm. that's keeping the profile up, which is... Yeah, uh, that's right. I'm... All you can think about as an ad guy. Profile it's all about branding. And, and... It's all about branding, exactly. I wonder if subconsciously that's why it was called that brand. I was yes. thinking about I was thinking about muffin break or something like that. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, no, look, it's it's wonderful to be able to create art, and um, I feel very grateful, you know, to be able to share music and in, in a in a time which is really uh, everyone's feeling down on everything. Um, it's nice to be able to put out content and have some great feedback and some. You know, just to keep us going, because that's what keeps us going. Fans and responses and 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 people liking what you're doing and connecting. That's all it's about. It's all I'm in it for. Mm. Well, it's good to hear the story today. Uh, thank you, Michael Burrows. Hey, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to the whole team at Noise 11. You know, you guys are, are great. Love reading all your stuff. And we're here. I'm not going anywhere. You can call it any time and I'll probably be sitting right here, either doodling on the piano or playing guitar. Or eating a muffin, either way. <laughs>